I don't think there has been a time in the modern world when we as a people have been in greater danger than we are today, right now. Now, I know that would-be prophets have always said something like that, that you could always find someone ready to tell you, oh, we're in danger, and things are bad, and they're going to get worse. In fact, uh, we've been hearing gloom and doom from the sundowners for as long as I can remember. The sundowners are that category of people who either they are economists or they are uh, preachers who are busy telling you how bad things are in the world and what's going to happen and how bad they're going to get. I have even been suckered into buying some of their books myself. I remember I bought one, I think, called Blood in the Streets. It had to do with the coming crash, stock market crash that was coming. Uh, there have been all sorts of them. I even wrote an article way back in the 60s on a book, about a book, based on a book that had just come out called Famine 1975, America's Decision, Who Will Survive? And the premise of the book was, and it's, it was accurate as far as it went, was that rising population in the world at large could be graphed on, on a page, and available food production could also be, and the, and the increase in it could be also be graphed on the same page. And those two lines on that graph crossed in 1975, which meant as of that date, there would no longer be enough food to be able for everyone in the country that, or the world to have enough to eat. And that the producing nations like, like the United States would have to start making decisions as to who would, get, who would get the food and who would not, who would survive and who would die. And it was a nightmare scenario. We were very, very uh, worried about it at the time. And you know, it, it was really, it's really surprising. If you were able to go back to the 60s, get out your almanacs and the different kinds of uh, statistical uh, measures of our people, it was really shocking how many things you could draw, many graphs you could draw, that would predict disaster by 1975. And it really made Herbert W. Armstrong, with his booklet, 1975 in Prophecy, look like a genius. He wasn't. He was really dead wrong, and that booklet turned out to be his, uh, one of his greatest embarrassments, as a matter of fact, in the years that came after that. A lot of you here will remember the great oil crisis of the 1970s. You will remember parking in long lines at the gas pumps to fill up your car. You couldn't get gas. And when you did get up there, what was the what were the prices getting up to? A dollar and a half? More than that? Uh, per gallon in those days? It was if you could get gas at all. Uh, the lines were terrible around there. And I remember everybody saying, well, boy, there was only, there were only 13 years of oil supplies left in the world. And was it 1974? That's what they told us. They'd done a real careful measurement. I read the stories, and they were done by experts and knowledgeable people. And there was a, you know, a voice in the wilderness here and there saying, oh, that's a bunch of malarkey. But people weren't listening to them. I don't know what it is. We seem to like to listen to, and we'll buy the books of the sundowners. But and no matter how many times they're wrong, I don't know why it is it doesn't affect us any more than it does. I think you will also remember, I, actually, I learned my, uh, my lesson about some of this stuff when, in the 1970s when beef prices were skyrocketing. We were up there at Big Sandy at the college at the time, and all the Aggies on campus were telling me, you know, beef prices are going up. There's no way for them to be anything but higher in the months and years ahead. And they had all the statistics, all the reasons, everything out of A&M, everything from all the people out there judging food prices in the world at large. Beef prices were going nowhere but up. You better move quickly and buy yourself a side of beef and put it in your freezer because the time will come and you'll be paying twice and three times as much for it. So I went out and I bought a side of beef. We had it all cut up nicely and put in our freezer at that time. And we bought that beef at the highest price for beef in a hundred years. Because shortly thereafter, just almost immediately thereafter, the price of beef headed south. Now, I don't know why I didn't figure this out at the time. What the doomsayers failed to take into account is that as a good becomes scarce, prices go up. And when prices go up, People who can make a little money on product, producing the thing that's coming into scarce supply are going to do it. Now, what what's really, really makes my action crazy was, at the time, when they were telling me that beef prices could no, go nowhere but up, all kinds of amateurs that I knew, amateur ranchers, were buying land and putting cows on it. That should have told me something right there, but I, not me. I was listening to the... Uh, to all of the Aggies who were telling me beef prices could go nowhere but higher. Well, the same thing happened in oil. As the price of oil reached certain levels, all of a sudden, exploration for oil became attractive to people who hadn't been looking for oil for a long time because prices were too low. 
And so they went out vigorously hunting for oil. And guess what? They found all kinds of oil. And now we have oil running out of our ears. Prices, what do you pay? I think I've seen the price for regular down below 90 cents a gallon once or twice in recent months. When it was, everybody said, no, it's going to, we're going to run out of gas. We're not going to have any gas. And Congress was busy passing laws against the gas guzzlers, forcing car manufacturers to make lighter and consequently more dangerous automobiles. And then spend, we had to spend more money making those dangerous automobiles safer with heavier bumpers and all that kind of stuff. It just goes round and around in a, in a circle. I also, another thing that I think we, I never, I didn't tumble to, was the realization which came to me later. Are you, do you realize what the cause is of most famines that have existed in history? It's not a lack of food production. It's not, it's not because people aren't able to produce more food. What do you think is the reason for most famines in the history of the world? War. War. Almost inevitably, all these places where we're trying to get food into people because people are starving and babies are dying out there, it's not because there isn't food available to be, for these people to be, to be gotten to these people. It's because of wars, regional wars that are racking the countryside and because the refugees are having to be driven across country lines and driven out into the desert where there is no food. It's war that causes these things, not the inability to produce food. So why am I telling you that we are in greater danger now than at any time in my lifetime? We are in greater danger now than we were in World War II. We are in greater danger now than we were during the Cold War and the Cuban Missile Crisis. We are in greater danger now than we were during the Arab oil embargo. Greater than the stock market crash of 1929. Greater than in the Great Depression when I was born. We are in greater danger because we are so stinking rich and increased with goods. I don't, I'm not going to ask you, remember, some of you may be old enough to remember when one of the great promises that politicians were making at a national convention was a car in every garage and a chicken in every pot. Now, I'm not even going to bother asking how many of you have got a car in your garage and a chicken in your freezer. That's passe. Most of you have got two cars in your garage and a freezer full of food, right? Not all. There are people who don't. But mostly now, the American dream is to have a car for every licensed driver in the household. And you'd be shocked at how many families have got precisely that. In fact, I think you'd be shocked as to how many households there are who have more vehicles than they have licensed drivers in the household. Most of the poor people in the country have a car. A surprising number, I think it's something like one-third, 33 to 36 percent of people who are measured in this country as poor actually own their own home. That's where we have come. Now, when I was a boy, you would never have used that, you know, the measure of poor. You'd never conclude that a person who owned his own home was poor, or a person who had a car was poor. The poor people were, you know, in rather, rather considered more difficult states than they were then. What I'm saying is that we are enormously prosperous. In fact, they keep telling us on the news nearly every night now that our economy is better than it has been in the history of the country. We are richer than we ever have been as a people. I think I, my memory serves me, I read the other day, that the current bull market started when the Dow was at 777, and it's now run to well over 9,000. you imagine the increase in wealth that comes about as a result of that? The enormous addition, you, you multiply, you know, the number of shares of stock by the number, by the price of the stock, and that tells you how much wealth there is in the Dow Jones Industrial Averages, all those stocks that are out there. It's enormous, and it's incredible to even contemplate how much money there is out there. Well, what I'm telling you at this point is not that we are in danger because there's a bubble in the stock market and the stock market might crash. No, that's not what I'm telling you. I think we are in danger because the stock market may go higher. It is not merely, though, that prosperity is bad. It's the problem is it's our response to prosperity that kills us and places us in danger. Now, to show you what I mean, I'd like for you to turn back to the first chapter of Proverbs, to a passage that really struck me when I was doing my radio broadcast on the, basically on uh, not long ago on making life work, and I was going through the book of Proverbs, and I came across this particular passage of Scripture. Now, this passage of Scripture is a, is a classic example of personification. 
Personification is a poetic device where you take an abstract value and you make a person out of it, or you, you, you attribute it uh, as a person to your listener and describe what this attribute is saying. In this case, the attribute is wisdom, and wisdom is personified as a woman. Wisdom cries without. She utters her voice in the street. She cries in the chief place of the concourse, in the openings of the gates. In the city, she utters her word, saying, How long, you simple ones, will you love simplicity, and the scorners delight in their scorning, and how long will you fools hate knowledge? Turn at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I'll make known my words unto you. How long, you simple ones, will you love simplicity? And I, I, I think of the number of bad mistakes I've made in my life because I didn't just sit down and think the decision through. Like the decision to buy a whole side of beef when all the signs around me told you know, said, no, no, prices of beef are going to drop because supply is going to be going up very shortly. This is not the lowest price you're going to find beef in the next ten years. Not by any stretch of the imagination. All the information was crying at me from the pages of the paper and from the people who were around me in the street corners. And I couldn't see it. Because I, I guess there were reasons why I didn't want to see it. Because I have called and you refused. I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. But you have said it not, my counsel. You wouldn't take my advice. It's out here. It's after you. It's crying. You hear it comes, it comes in one ear and unfortunately goes out the other. How long are you going to do this? But because you do, I will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear comes. When your fear comes as desolation and your destruction comes as a whirlwind, then distress and anguish will come upon you. Then you're going to go looking for me. Then you're going to say, oh, I, I need more wisdom. I want wisdom. Come to me. Speak to me. Teach me. And so forth. But I will not answer. They will seek me early, but they will not find me. The fact is that most of the time, when we decide to go looking for wisdom, it's too late. For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They wouldn't have any of my counsel because they despised my reproof. Guess what? They're going to eat the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. Whatever you do, that's the results that you're going to get. I got to eat all that beef. I think we ate it all. May have given some of it away down through the years. That very expensive, high-priced beef that really wasn't all that good, if I remember. <laughs> it wasn't that much better than anything else I might have bought, as it turned out. Anyway, he continues to say, For the turning away of the simple shall slay them, and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. Now, I think that's a fascinating statement there. The prosperity of fools shall destroy them. It doesn't say that prosperity doesn't help a fool. It doesn't say that prosperity is a, is a passive ingredient in your life. And if you just happen to have a lot of money come your way, even though you're a fool, uh, well, it's just there. No, no. He says that prosperity is an active force for destruction for a fool. It actually hurts him. And that's why I say that the raging prosperity in this country right now exposes us to enormous dangers that I don't think we have adequately considered. The prosperity of fools shall destroy them in that. I think, is precisely where we are now. Now, we can't say that we haven't been warned. If you'll turn back to Deuteronomy 8, I want to underline this for us so that we'll understand the dynamics of what's happening to us now in this country, even as we sit here. In Deuteronomy the 8th chapter, in verse 1, it says, All the commandments which I command you this day shall you observe to do that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord promised to your fathers. And you shall remember all the way which the Lord your God led you these forty years in the wilderness to humble you, to prove you, and to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And I could hearken back and I could say, do you remember all those years back in the thirties? Back in 19, starting in 1929, when people were on the streets with cups in their hands and people were out selling apples and the stockbrokers were jumping out of the highest building they could find in a building on, on, on Wall Street? Do you remember how hard it was in those years and how men were going about from house to house and how women were actually giving them a meal for chopping firewood out behind the house? Do you remember how hard it was back in those years? I did all that to you so that I wanted to find out where your heart was. And he humbled you. And he suffered you to go hungry. And he fed you with manna, which you didn't know and your fathers didn't know. And he did all that that he can make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord does man live. One of the reasons why God puts us through poverty 
One of the reasons why he allows us to endure hardship like that is to impress upon our minds that life goes on. And that life doesn't depend on the two cars you've got in your garage. Life doesn't depend on the food you've got in your refrigerator today. Life is life. And life depends on you and the people that you're dealing with day in and day out. And depends on God and your association with God. doesn't depend on money. He said, your raiment didn't wax old upon you. I didn't leave you without any blessings at all. Your foot didn't swell for 40 years. You shall consider in your heart that as a man chastens his son, so the Lord your God chastens you. Now, therefore, having been through all this, he said, you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God to walk in his ways and to fear him. For the Lord your God is going to bring you into a good land, a land of brooks of water, fountains and depths that spring out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of oil, olive, and honey, a land wherein you shall eat bread without scarceness. You shall not lack anything upon it, a land whose stones are iron, out of whose hills you may dig brass. You're going to have agricultural produce to the full. You're going to have all the mineral wealth and deposits you could ever imagine. Now, you know, I've been to Palestine several times, and to me it seems like a grim place. And so it's dry. It's not a particularly pleasant country. It's not a beautiful place. And Jerusalem, the beautiful, as they said people sing songs about, isn't. But I'll tell you this much. This description fits the United States of America like a glove as far as what we have had in this country, of the agricultural produce to the point that the government has to buy it up and store it to keep prices from collapsing. Think about it. I mean, they've got food stored all over the place. The government buys up cheese and then gives it to the food and, uh, schools and gives it to the poor out here because we make too much cheese. Cheese! Which I think most people in most times would consider a luxury. We've got too much cheese and grain and corn stored in barns all over the place. We have food for a thousand years that we could produce off this land of ours so that we could feed much of the world with the food that we could produce in this country. He said, I want you to think about this, though. When you have eaten and you're full, then you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which he has given you. Beware lest you forget the Lord your God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes which I command you this day, lest when you have eaten and are full and have built good houses and dwelt in them, and look at the houses that we all live in, when you have herds on, your flocks are multiplied, and your silver and your gold is multiplied, and everything you have is multiplied. And folks, the poorest among us are wealthy compared to most of this world. When your heart is lifted up, then your heart be lifted up, and you forget the Lord your God. That's the risk. That's the danger. And it's a greater danger than war. It's a greater danger than famine. It's a greater danger than economic collapse. The danger is that your heart will be lifted up and you'll forget God, who led you through that great and terrible wilderness where were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought, where there was no water, who brought forth water out of the rock of flint, who fed you in the wilderness with manna, which your fathers never knew, that he might humble you. He made you do without for a while. Why? So he might humble you and he might do, prove you and do you good in your latter end. Be careful, lest you say in your heart, My power and the might of my hand has gotten me this well. My foresight. I was smarter than my neighbors. I see something that they don't see. So I'm going to rush up out and I'm going to buy up a bunch of stuff so I'll have it and they won't. Think how smart I am? He says, But you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he that gives you the power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. And it shall be, if you at all forget the Lord your God and walk after other gods and serve them and worship them, I testify against you this day, you shall surely perish. All as the nations which the Lord your God destroyed before your face, so shall you perish, because you would not be obedient to the Lord your God. Now, I think the warning here is one that is as plain as any warning ever could be as to, you know, God said, look out. Because when prosperity comes rolling in, you are going to be tempted to forget God. In the process of forgetting God, you're going to forget all the reasons why things have worked for you. You're going to forget all the reasons why that when you put crops in the ground, they came up in great abundance and you had more than you ever really thought the crop would produce. You have forgotten why whenever you made an investment, that it worked. You've forgotten that it was God who gave you the power to get wealth. You forget that, 
and you're going to lose all and more because what you really are going to be in danger of losing in addition to all that is your own life. There's another passage down in verse chapter 17 of Deuteronomy in verse 14 which I think speaks to us in a very special way. That 8th chapter speaks to man in any generation and at all times. But chapter 17 moves to a kind of a different age of Israel that would come in the future. He says, When you are come into the land which the Lord your God gives you and shall possess it and dwell therein, and you shall say, I will set a king over me like the nations that are round about me. Now, this is not necessarily talking about the king that God put over them. He's saying when the time comes and you decide that you're going to have a leader, be he king, be he president, be he whatever, he said, if you're going to do that, you shall, you shall in any wise set him king over you, whom the Lord your God shall choose, one from among your brethren. That shall you set a king over you, that you may not set a stranger over you who is not your brother. Then he says this about this king that you're to set over you. He shall not multiply horses to himself. You know what horses are for? They're not just for riding, folks. They're for war in the ancient world. Horses were the tanks of warfare in this time. He shall not multiply horses to himself, nor shall he cause the people to, re to return to Egypt to the end that he should multiply horses. In other words, we don't make alliances with Egypt. We don't go back down to them and ask for a military alliance so that we can double our armies together to fight other people. For as much as the Lord has said unto you, shall henceforth return no more that way. Neither shall he multiply women to himself. That, uh, women to himself, that his heart shall send and fetch uh, him, him, then, him thence, and deliver him into the hand of the avenger. I'm sorry, I couldn't make any sense of that. I'd turn two pages instead of once. Knew something was wrong. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself or women to himself, that his heart turn not away. Neither shall he greatly multiply silver and gold. In other words, once you get a leader in office, he is not to multiply horses, he is not to multiply his women, and he's not to try to gain money for himself. It shall be when he sits upon the throne of the kingdom that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests and the Levites. Every new king was to sit down and by hand write out a copy. He could not pay someone to write it out. He had to write it out in his own hand in a book. And it shall be with him. And he shall read in that book all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words of... of uh, I'm sorry, I lost my place again. All the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them, that his heart be not lifted up above his brethren, that he turn not aside from the commandment to the right hand nor to the left, to the end that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. Now, you know, this is really a, a fascinating thing to read about, because here we are. Now, regardless of who you believe about who is telling the truth in Washington, whether you believe President Clinton, whether you believe Monica Lewinsky, whether you believe uh, Kathleen Willey or any of these people, women and money are making a fair bid to bring this president down. Women and money. And that's precisely the thing that God warned Israel to start with about when you have a king up there, he's not to multiply horses, which implies military power. He is not to multiply his women, and he's not to multiply his money. These things are trouble. He has warned, actually, that money and, and, and uh, women are said are making a fair bid to bring him down. And what's interesting to me about it is that the president was warned about this in the book that he waves at us when he walks out of church on Sunday morning. Now, it is a shame, I think, that he was not required to handwrite his own copy of the law as his first act as President of the United States. Because maybe he would have written that segment out, and he would realize what a danger he posed to himself and to the country if he was careless in any of these things. Whether he even did it or not, the fact that he allowed himself to be opened up to the accusation was an act of folly on his part. And for those people out there who think that I'm a Republican because I criticize the President, I am not. And I wonder if you would have thought Elijah was a Republican for preaching against Ahab. Because there is a time when you have God's Word that you must speak God's Word faithfully. And when you see something, you must call it. If you, are, if you have a platform, 
And I have a platform. I have a platform right here that I'm speaking to you. It's going on tape, and it'll go to you know a few thousand people before it's finished. I have a radio program. And when those opportunities come up, I have to call it like it is. You know, what, what are you supposed to do? The book says, cry aloud, spare not, and show my people her sins, and all that. But the fact is, I am not, it's not so much President Clinton that bothers me. President Clinton could turn out to be relatively innocent in all that's said and done. I say relatively because it is stupid for a man in his position to allow himself to be alone with a young woman in his office in the, in, in the White House. It's just done because of what he opens himself up to in terms of false allegations. That's why Leon Panetta, his chief of staff, when he was there, would not allow that type of thing to take place because, apart from what he thought the president might do, he knew it looked bad. And he knew it opened the president up for what? Black male or worse in the process. And we must, you know, you must not ever have the president of the United States compromised in that way. His chief of staff knew that. And it was a colossal lack of judgment on his part, or worse, that allowed him to do it. But as I said, it's not so much the president that bothers me. It's us. It's us. For we are people, based upon the polls, who seem to be prepared to say that we believe he is a lying, philandering adulterer who abuses power, but we are pleased to have such a man in office because the economy is good. They hit Trent Lott with that question. I, I saw it on television. It was funny. Uh, he was normally a man who was prepared for just about any question that comes his way, but he almost gasped. He said, he said, well, I hope not. If it's true that that's the way people in this country think, that it's the economy and not character that matters, well, I've got to rethink my whole idea of government. And I understood more or less what the man was talking about at the time. What, well, I want to also take you over to Jeremiah chapter 5. Jeremiah chapter 5. And verse 25. God, first of all, has been talking about all the good things that could come to them in that country. And he says, Your iniquities have turned away these things, and your sins have withheld good things from among you. For among my people are found wicked men. They lay wait as he that sets snares. They set a trap. They catch men. Like a cage is full of birds, so are their houses full of deceit. They have become great. They are waxed rich. They are waxed fat. They shine. Yea, they overpass the deeds of the wicked. Now, what is really funny about this is, how long ago was this written? You know, you go back to Jeremiah, you're going back, you know, way back, 700, what, B.C.? Here's a prophet that comes along talking about a nation that had gone into this particular pattern of behavior, and you have precisely the same pattern then. That because men are rich, because they wax fat, he says they are so fat their body shines. They're, they have plenty of oil in their diet, you know. And the oil comes through on their skin and their skin shines. They are so healthy and fat and all this kind of thing. And he said they, they, that they overpass the deeds of the wicked. Which Mitch essentially says to me is, because their life is good, because they're making money, because they've got all the cars they want and all the houses they want, because they can take two vacations a year if they want to, because they can go anywhere in the world on vacation if they want to, because they've got money, and the money is building up in their bank accounts, and they have silver and gold running out of their ears, that they are willing to overpass the deeds of the wicked. They're in business for a very long time, that people will break laws, and then they'll overlook the breaking of the law because they're making some money out of it. And you will sort of tolerate that kind of thing and say, well, that's business. And it goes on all the time. And there's a pattern of self-justification that I, I don't know about you, but I find very troubling in society at large. It's this that, yeah, well, everybody does it. Everybody does it. And whenever you try to nail someone down for a lack of ethics, a breach of ethics, or dishonesty in, in, in their political practices, they say, well, the other party does it, be it Democrats, be it Republicans. Everybody does it. And this everybody does it. Is all, it, it's seen by people as a mitigating factor in how you actually should judge someone. You don't say, you know, here is something, these people have broken the law. And we're going to let them off because somebody else has broken the law. And people give us that, and they expect it to fly. 
They expect it to work. And guess what? It works. It works. We, the people, will sit and listen to that, and we'll say, oh, that's true, everybody does it, and we will buy that little red herring that somebody has drawn across our nose, and we won't make the step to say, all right, what you did was wrong, what they did was wrong, I've got you. I'll look for them later. And we're going to hold your feet to the fire, and you're going to obey the law, or else. I hear all this stuff about campaign finance reform. My response to it is, well, you want to pass more laws. You're not obeying the laws we've got. To me, unless or until they're willing to start prosecuting politicians who break campaign finance laws, what's the point in passing the laws in the first place? They might be better served to repeal the laws that are there to get so that they, at least in that circumstance, would stop people from breaking the law. Because if you get away with the law, they can't break them anymore, right? Pardon my sarcasm, but uh, frankly, we are in a situation now to where public conduct on all sides breeds cynicism in the American people. What's worrying me about it is, though, is that we are coming more and more as a people in this country to accept it, and what the newspaper reporters, the talking heads, the lawyers we see every night on television Sunday morning and what have you are telling us, and the pollsters are telling us, it's because we've got money. And they assume that if we have a terrible stock market crash, and unemployment skyrocketed to 10%, that everybody in the country right now will be prepared to hang President Clinton for all the things that they've been justifying him for in the past several months. you think that's true? I'm afraid you know, that's what all the people who watch us are telling us about ourselves, that we would ride, ride them out of town on a rail if our lives were bad. But because our lives are good and we're making money, we think, well, man, that says I approve of, I appreciate, I can admire the job that the president of the nation is doing. They are waxed fat, they shine, they overpass the deeds of the wicked. They don't judge the cause. Or they won't actually get in there and judge the cause. We've got laws here. The laws have been broken, and we're not going to judge that anymore. No, no. And part of the problem and the reason why they won't judge it, you do understand that, don't you? I, I trust you understand why it is that members of Congress on both sides of the aisle are reluctant to judge a leader for sexual peccadilloes? It's because so many of them have got things in their own closets. It's because so many of them are guilty of the same thing. Maybe not in the same degree, maybe not in the same way, not in the same time. But whenever all of them start thinking about what they have done, they are simply not willing to step up to the plate and say, It's time. Do your worst. Show me. Yeah, I've made mistakes in my life as well. I've had, I have my sins here, but folks, it's time to judge the cause. No, they don't do that. They prosper. And the right of the needy, they won't judge. They'll leave all kinds of things, you know, on the side about the needy and the poor and people who need help. All that stuff is going to back burner. We've got other things that we're concerned about, making money. Shall I not visit for these things, saith the Lord? Do you think that I'm, my soul is not going to be avenged on a nation like this? We're, we are, even if we didn't believe we were the nation this was aimed at, we are a nation like this. God says, you think I'm, I'm going to allow that to just pass? A wonderful and a horrible thing is committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely. The priests bear rule by their means. And my people love to have it so. Why? Because we're making money. That's what the prophets said. And that's what they're telling us every day on the news. The opinion makers that come on television. The prophets prophesy falsely, the priests bear rule by their means, and we're happy with it. Why? Because we're making money. That is a terrible, terrible statement that, that, that the prophet makes about us, and these guys who aren't prophets, but just news, newsmen, are making about us today as well. Turn back to Hosea, the fourth chapter. Hosea, chapter 4. I find myself here more than I like these days on the broadcast in the church. Hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel, for the Lord has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. It's almost as though people are determined to stamp out the knowledge of God. You have a voice here and a voice there and a light here and a beacon there, but otherwise it's dark. By swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break out and blood touches blood. The blood from one crime runs into the blood of another. 
Therefore shall the land mourn, and everyone that dwells therein shall languish. This particular line of reasoning here isn't so much the fact that you're rich and you're so nasty rich yet. He is just talking about swearing. That is, by giving the oath, holding up your hand and swearing to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and then lying. You can't depend on people to tell the truth under oath anymore. And I, it blows my mind. I watch television, and I see a lawyer sitting there on television, a man who has been admitted to the bar in some state, somewhere, and saying it doesn't matter. People lie all the time in civil suits. It doesn't matter if someone swears, puts his hand on the Bible, holds up his right hand, swears before God to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and lies. Doesn't matter. Nobody's ever prosecuted for that. Right. I'll tell you this much. You and I try it. You and I will be in jail. We'll be in jail because we're not lawyers. We'll be in trouble, deep trouble, because we don't know the system. And we can't work the system, play the system. Don't try it. When you go into court, be a civil suit or criminal suit, you'd better tell the truth, because they will come after you if you don't. Therefore shall the land mourn, and every one that dwells in it shall languish. The beasts of the field, the fowls of the heaven, the fish of the sea shall be taken away. Yet let no man strive nor approve another, for you your people are people I will argue with the, with the priest. Therefore you shall fall in the day, and the prophet also with you in the night, and I will destroy your mother. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I will reject you, that you shall be no priest to me, Seeing you have forgotten the law of your God, I will forget your children. And that one makes my blood run cold. As I, and I, I think I heard on the radio today that there has been, just today, that there's been another school shooting someplace. I didn't get the details of it. I just got in on the very end of it. And it was, it was here we go again. Our children do show signs that God's forgotten them. He just say, no, you don't want me in your life. I'm out of your life. That means you're I'm out of your children's life, too. And then he says this in verse 7, As they were increased, so they sinned against me, so I will turn their glory into shame. And that's what I meant in the beginning of the sermon when I said, I think we may be in the greatest danger we have been in the history of this country. Because, not because of the danger of the collapse of the stock market, but because of the danger the thing may go higher. And we may become more wealthy. And there will be more money out here washing back and forth through our society. And all of us will begin to say, well, look how smart we are, and look how good we are, and look what great things we have done, and never, and, and completely forget God. And all the while, the little warnings keep cropping up in newspapers across the country about the things that are happening to our children. The girl and her boyfriend, who gave birth to this baby in a motel room and threw it in the dumpster, had both pled guilty to manslaughter to avoid a uh, first-degree murder sentence and perhaps life in prison. They'll probably be in jail for two, two and a half years as a result of it. Still, the jury's still out on what's going to happen to the two boys up in Jonesboro, Arkansas, who shot up all those girls and the teacher out behind school that day. And then there was the shootings that took place up in Paducah, Kentucky. And there's just more. And you keep seeing the sickness cropping up among the children. And drug use among the children is just staggering in its implications. There, there, are, there are signs, oddly enough, in some quarters of our society that it's the children who are beginning to react against some of this. It's the children who are beginning to take the lead in prayer in school. Not teachers, not parents, not administrators, because they can't by law. But so far, they can't stop the children themselves. And there are signs that among our children, it's one of the only hopeful signs that I see in our society today, is that there are children who are taking the lead and putting prayer back in their own lives and that in the lives of children, other children that they know in school. But it's a voice crying in the wilderness is what that is. What about us in all these dangerous times? What are we supposed to do? Well, there's a Psalm 49 that kind of maybe speaks to us a little bit in, this situ in the midst of this situation. It says in 49 verse 5, Psalm 49 5, Wherefore should I fear in the days of evil, when the iniquity of my enemies shall compass me on every side? They that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches, not one of them can by any means redeem his brother, 
nor give to God a ransom for him. You know, all around me there are wealthy people. All around there are people who boast in their riches. They're just filthy rich and getting richer all the time. Do you realize that not one of them can actually redeem his nearest of kin from God's judgment? All of his money, his entire estate, sell his house, sell his cars, sell all his stocks, put all the money in one bundle, do you realize that he cannot give God a ransom for his brother or even for himself? The redemption of their souls is precious, and you can't reach it, that he should live forever and not see corruption. You're not going to make it. You can't buy your way beyond this life. But he sees that wise men die, and likewise the fool and the brutish person. They leave their wealth to others. Their inward thought is that their houses shall continue forever, and their dwelling places to all generations. They call their lands after their own names. But man, being an honor, doesn't last. He's like the beasts that perish. All you've got, all your houses, all your lands, all your stocks, all your bonds, and I'm going to save your life. The time's come. Time comes, you're gone. In Proverbs 23, verse 4, a piece of advice for us. Don't labor to be rich. Cease from your own wisdom. Will you set your eyes, your desire? What it means is, will you, are you going to set your desire on something that doesn't exist? That's what he's saying. Are you going to actually look out there at something you can't even see, something that doesn't exist? You're going to set your heart on that? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away like an eagle. I don't know. You know, it's, it's strange to me. I noticed it back when the big uh, stock market debacle, when it crashed 500 points in one day back when. And I'm in the moaning and the groaning about the loss of wealth, the enormous loss of money that took place in the society. And I really puzzled me in a way that people really don't seem to understand that just because they own a stock and it's gone up 100% better than value, that doesn't mean they have twice as much money as they had before. They still own the same number of shares of the same company that they owned before the price of the stock went up. That's all. Nothing changed. If the stock was paying a dollar dividend before, it's probably paying a dollar dividend today, and it's a lower percentage dividend as a result of the higher price than it was before. But still the same money, and you can still cash it, and you can still buy the same thing today with it you could have bought yesterday. It's just that what some fool will pay for that stock has gone up. That's all. And you can know that. The stock market right now has gone up so much that most of the people who are, who are in it, who have been in it for some period of time now, they don't even worry. I, someone told me the other day the stock market could crash 30%, and I would still be ahead. Of course, what happens if it goes down 50%? The truth is, they still own the same thing they owned before. X number of shares of this line of stocks, nothing has changed, except what the other fool is willing to pay for those stocks. But the truth is, riches make themselves wings, and they fly away as an eagle to heaven. You know, I really wonder, when somebody looks at the stock market and they see it crash, and they, and they give you a news item that says, how many billions of dollars were lost in the stock market today? Do you have any idea where it went? Where'd it go? Did it just disappear? No, it didn't disappear. It never was there. It never was there. You only can realize money out of the stock market when you sell. You know, you get dividends. That's money out of the stock market. But you only get the money when you sell. That wealth was never there. And that's the thing that people don't understand. They are setting their eyes on something that doesn't exist. Now, owning stock is good. You own a piece of a company. If it's a good company, it's making money, that's fine. I would encourage you to do that. But don't set your heart on it. And don't imagine that it's going to be there forever. And don't imagine that just because it's gone up so much, because some poor fool is willing to pay that much money for it, that you, that you now own all that much money. No, you don't. Mark 10, in verse 17. When Jesus was gone forth into the way, there came a man running and kneeled to him and said, Good Master, what can I do that I can inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, Why do you call me good? There's none good but God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Don't kill. Don't steal. Don't bear false witness. Defraud not. Honor your father and your mother. And he answered and said, Master, I've observed all this from my youth. He was a good kid, good young man. He did a lot of good, lot of good things in his life. And Jesus looked at him and loved it. You know, he, said, he just took his head. I like this kid. And he said, tell you what you do then. You have one thing that's lacking in your life. Go your way. Sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven and take up this cross and follow me. 
Now, that's a scary thing. Because some people look at that and they think, well, that means that Jesus says that everybody's going to follow him and has to sell everything they have and give it away to the poor, and that's not quite true. But Jesus was saying to this young man, if you're going to follow me, if we're going to go out and do the work that we have in store, you're going to be one of my apostles, one of my disciples. This young man had a shot at being one of the twelve, apparently, at this time. I don't know about the timing of it. It might have been a little too late, but I don't think so. I think he had, Jesus had great things in mind for this young man. He could have been a replacement for Judas later on, as far as that's concerned. And, but he had to, in order to take that responsibility, be completely unencumbered. And it tells us that the young man went away sorrowful because he had great possessions. This is the risk of prosperity. Because, you see, there are two sides of the story. You could, you could look at that young man and say that he was greedy, but candidly, if that was the attitude in his heart, I'm not so sure that Jesus would have even invited him. The fact of the matter is that people who are prosperous and wealthy, oftentimes, especially in, in, at this age, have enormous responsibilities. And he would have had to walk away from a responsibility which provided jobs for all kinds of people, possibly. And he just couldn't do it. He couldn't, couldn't walk away from all that kind of stuff and follow Jesus off down the road. And it was really a, a sad moment. And Jesus looked around and said to the disciples, says, How hardly have they, shall they that have riches enter the kingdom of God? The disciples were astonished at his word because in that day and at that time, the assumption of wealth was that you were a blessing from God and if you were poor, God had cursed you. You know, which is really a stupid idea when you stop to think about it. That just because you're rich means God's blessed you and just because you're poor means God's cursed you ignores an awful lot of valuable information out of the Bible. Well, anyway, his disciples were astonished, but Jesus answered and said, Children, how hard it is for them that trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. And it is that trust that's worrisome. It's whenever you, you know, really face a crisis and you realize that you, you really are leaning on what you have been able to build up, accumulate, hold on to, and multiply to see you through the hard times ahead. The ability to visualize yourself with your house burnt down, no insurance, and all your money gone, to visualize yourself as still having a life, still having a God, still having people you love, still having people who love you, if you are so frightened by that, maybe you have come to the place to where you have passed from making a good, wise use of your riches, your wealth, to trusting them. Give it some thought. His disciples had a hard time with that, but he said it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they were, then they were astonished out of measure. And they said, well, who can be saved? Because the rich man's blessed by God. And Jesus said, well, with men it's impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. Then Peter began to say to him, but look, we have left everything and have followed you. And Jesus answered and said, you know, that's almost a plaintive thing coming back from Peter. See, so watch this young man go away who had an enormous amount. Well, now, Peter, he didn't have that much, but he had left everything he had. Fishing boat, his dad, the nets. He just left it all, walked away from it. He said, look, we've left all that we've followed you. And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that has left house, or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or land, for my sake, and the Gospels, but he shall receive a hundredfold now and this time, houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions, and in the world to come, eternal life. But there are many that shall be first, that shall be last, and the last first. You know, I don't think that I can be in a position to know what that is precisely like, but I do know one thing. That I left a former life, for God's sake, and the Gospels. And I have received mothers and brethren and children and, you know, all this thing so many times over that I, I can't even imagine, you know, what it's like. I can't even visualize all of them. It is really as though, you know, when you come to follow God and you move into His work and you move into His Gospel, you move into His church, that you develop a family around you, a possessions, land, and the whole thing, in symbolically speaking, shows that you come into possessions that you never really ever imagined in your life. I started out with a sermon by saying, I, I think that as a society, 
We are in grave danger today because that the increase in wealth has already caused us to change our values, to turn our back on the fundamentals as a people, and to begin to, to cherish wealth above character. But for us in whom the word of Christ dwells richly, and those of us who, in whom the Spirit of God is, and those of us who have, have made a decision in our life to walk away from the world, not necessarily at this point in time selling everything we have and giving it to the poor, but who have come to the place to where at least we're ready when God calls upon us to do so. Those of us in that position, I think, are the strongest of all to survive in a world that seems hell-bent on tearing its own heart out. Jesus said, after this manner, pray you, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. And that is the thing I think that we look to and that holds all of us together.